do. All right, we've got HDMI. I have dongles. All right, well, she is the dongle plug in. Um, so, hi guys, uh, my name is Ben Benone from Bioraps. Uh, welcome everyone to Triple Nights. Um, yeah, lots of familiar faces. We've got some new ones here tonight too, that's great. Uh, so, uh, welcome everyone. As you guys hopefully know, this is something we put on every um, part of the, uh, the, the Boston meetup every other month. Uh, we bring in a uh, talented speaker such as Danny to, uh, to talk to y'all and cover something uh, in depth. So, uh, tonight, Danny is going to be talking to us. Uh, Danny is a friend of ours, uh, been uh, in the Drupal Nights sort of queue before. Um, she's, uh, she's got her master's in. Uh, from Bentley and uh, Human Information, something or other, UX. <laughs> Ask her, she's uh, got the same degree. <laughs> I told you on it three times. <laughs> um, human factors and information design. There you go. She knows stuff. Yeah, she knows a lot about it. She's, about she's stuff. written a book literally on UX and uh, Drupal. And we're really uh, honored to have her with us tonight. Um, looking, looking forward to, uh, to her presentation. So with that, I'll pass it over to Danny. Thank you so much. No problem. All right, let me just, I'm just gonna double check that this is working. Sweet, all right, so, hi everyone. Um, so I am here to talk about the politics of design systems. Oddly enough, I pitched this to DrupalCon, and they are like, it sounds like you're talking about front-end frameworks. And no, no, I'm not talking about that. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the company that I work for and what I do first. Um, so I am um, the Director of Digital User Experience at Pega Systems. We do um, a really interesting product that does digital process automation and customer engagement software for very large enterprises. We sell it into the Fortune 500. Um, if you have had to resolve a credit card fraud incident, about 70% of those are resolved using a Pega product. Um, we also do customer service, we do marketing, we do a whole bunch of different stuff. The work of the digital team um, serves all of the people who sell, buy, and build things with our software. So we run the corporate website, peg.com. We also oversee the user experience of the developer community and um, many of the other corporate websites that we have. We oversee some internal apps. There's a lot of things that my tiny little team gets to do. Um, and I'm very proud of them all. I am also the product owner of Bolt, which is the third generation of our digital design system. This is the front end code that powers um, right now most of Pega.com and is soon to power the developer community PDN. And we're going to be rolling it around uh, out across all of our websites for the next couple of years. Um, Salem, the mad genius over there, is our front end architect. Um, he is one of the people who works on Bolt. But I want to talk a little bit about what a design system is and what we usually talk about when I read about design systems. So when you're thinking of a design system, you might think of building blocks. You might think of atomic design. You've got elements and components and UI patterns. You might think of doing a fun cut up web screens workshop and you organize them into categories and then you start designing all of these patterns and it's super fun and then you have a git repository and you're doing all this code but guess what it's not about code it's not even design a design system is about organizational change when you introduce a design system into a team that is already building products you are fundamentally changing how they design and build things. And that is scary. There is an emotional journey that I have seen my organization go down, and I've also seen many other organizations who start building large-scale design systems go down. You get super excited when you sell the thing, and when people are like, yeah, yeah, let's totally do this. And then you start putting in the first layers, the building blocks. You get the fonts, you get the colors and everything. All of a sudden, you've been doing all of this front-end framework stuff. The stakeholders are like, well, where is it? <laughs> awesome, I love this song. I want to go in first. And people start wondering, where is this thing? I thought that this was, I thought that this was going to be done, and why isn't it done yet? Um, and you get the first release, super excited. People start looking into the product, stuff breaks. 
Why is it broken? Why is this so hard? I want to hurt someone. <laughs> and then you start figuring it out. You get through the hurdles, you go, and this happens over and over again. I wish I could say it's just because Pega is crazy. I wish I could say, I would love to say that, but I've seen a bunch of um, a bunch of presentations for people doing large-scale web systems, and the story is the same. There is this emotional journey that people go into. And so it made me realize that fundamentally design systems are an organizational change effort. And fortunately, I used to work at Harvard Business Review. Guess what they write about? Organizational change. So I found a framework that I was introduced a while ago um, to a while ago by a guy named John Cotter who wrote a couple of really good books. His book, Buy-In, is one of the best books you'll ever read if you ever have to convince people of something. Um, and it's a super quick read. But this is from a book called Accelerate, which is an eight-step framework for creating organizational change. And I found it very useful when I was thinking about how to frame a design system effort in an organization. So I'll go over the steps really briefly, and then I have some more detail on each of these steps. Uh, the first step is to create a sense of urgency around a big opportunity. You have to get people on board with why this needs to happen in a way that's a bit more compelling as we should do it because I like it. Um, you have to build a guiding coalition that's going to help move this effort forward. You need to, uh, you need to create a strategic vision and initiatives that are going to help you make progress along the journey and enlist a volunteer army to actually help you do the thing. You have to make it easy for these people to help you by eliminating the barriers, making it really easy to contribute to what you're doing. You have to generate some short-term win short wins. You want to show people progress at every step along the way. Um, because that way, you're going to be able to sustain acceleration and actually create and institute the change into your organization's DNA. So here are some tips that I found that help you do this. So the first thing is creating a sense of urgency around a big opportunity. The worst thing you can do if you're trying to sell a design system to your organization is to come in with some story about how this is what forward-thinking organizations do and you know if we took ourselves seriously we would have a design system and I just saw this great conference and you should totally do this because I saw this at a conference. That can be really compelling for some people. It's not compelling to the executives who need to pay for this. You need to have a dual approach. It's fine to say this is what people are doing on the field, but you have to mix it in with helping people understand the cost of not doing this. The simplest way of doing that is the UI inventory. I created this slide in five minutes. This is two of our websites. These are all the blue buttons. Notice the differences. Not only are they visually inconsistent, which really bugs the marketers, each of these things represents a separate section of the code. This, each of these things is code a developer had to write. If you add another one on our site, look, more buttons. And then we added our design system. I know there's not a bill there, but there's even more buttons after that. So this starts to make the case for you. This, actually scraping the code and looking at the number of selectors that you have, which Salem did, I think this is probably over a year old. This starts making the case for you. Not only is all of this code that someone had to write, this is what's making your page load really slow. This is contributing to the performance issues. And if you can't convince them with those two things alone, hit them in the pocketbook. Each of those things is an extra line of code for a button. We have much more important things to do. If we are able to reduce the redundancy of our code, we can actually save up to 20% of a developer's time. When you start adding that up to the number of developers that you have and the number of things you've got in the queue, the design system starts looking cheap. So now, 
what you want to do is you want to start taking all of these things and building them into a pitch deck. Just like you were a startup and you're going after VC funding, you have a deck with all of these things. And you're like, look, this is what we're trying to do here. This is the benefit that we're going to get from this. This is the cost of not doing this. And you roadshow that around to executives and to team members and all of these different people, anyone who has a stake and can actually help you get this done. So that's the first lesson, how to pitch deck, roadshow it, make sure that people understand the cost of not doing it and the benefit of doing it. The next step is to build a guided coalition. Now, this is a small group of people that's going to actually help you move this thing forward and sell it around the building. So you've got your own pitch deck. Now you've got a couple of people who are really convinced they're going to help you sell it around. Now, I'm a big fan of a product triad. This is something I discovered from Shopify. They do this with their design system and their product. Basically, the product triad is a three-legged stool. It includes a business um, a business representative who's the product owner, a representative from UX, and a representative from tech or dev. And what these people do is they come together and they make together decisions regarding the future of the project and the initiative. They make sure that each of those layers is considered as we're moving forward. So it's not just the front end engineer who's making decisions, it's also the UX person. We're making sure that all of this aligns with the goals of the business. It all fits together. And that can be really effective because if it's just, as long as it's just one person who's managing the design system, they're going to get overlocked, they're going to get overbogged or bogged down and pulled in 83 different directions. And there's always going to be some aspect of the business, whether it's tech, UX, or, UX or stakeholders that feel like they're being left out of the community. So if you have a product triad, it's a lot easier to make sure that you have a solid governance model in place. And that's going to be really important as the system starts to scale. So then you have to form a strategic vision and initiatives. Ideally, that's actually going to fit in with the, business, with, with the strategy of the business. And this is where that pitch deck comes in handy. Right? We have an, an organizational initiative to go faster, to move with a sense of urgency. Well, this is how this is going to help us. It's going to help us by increasing our velocity, by allowing us to scale up more quickly. This is also where we realize that a design system, again, not code, it's a product. It has a roadmap. It has releases. It serves the ecosystem. If you just think of it as a code repository, A, the designers get pissed off because they can't really do anything with this. And you don't necessarily get a sense of how this is going to serve the business. So you want to treat it like an actual product. So there are a few uh, methods. We just started rolling this out recently. Um, but one of them comes from Atlassian. Their team playbook, which is really fantastic if you haven't checked it out. Uh, they have in Confluence a blueprint called the Project Poster. And what this does is it's a workshop that you run. It's about an hour long. And you get together with all of the stakeholders and you start looking at defining the, product, the, the problem space, how it fits in with the organizational strategy, identifying not only the problem but the impact of that problem. And this helps the team understand, okay, yeah, this is why we're doing the thing that we're doing, and this is what they're, and this is what we're going to do. It also helps you have those tough conversations about what are we not doing? How are we not gonna, how are we, how are we going to, um, how are we going to make sure that what we're doing fits in a reasonable scope? And then you start getting into a roadmap. Now, the way that I started doing roadmaps is a little more high level. It's more about strategy and, and goals. It's a little bit less about features. But you turn that from there, you turn it into release plans. And so you start, and you start looking at how does this move across our different projects. Um, so for us, we actually started with Pega.com because we were working on a rebrand and we started moving Pega.com over to Drupal 8 and we relaunched the design system along with the replatforming. 
You may also, and this is totally realistic, you may also spend six months creating the design system and then build your website. We chose not to do that because we're insane. Um, but also, it helped us get a lot of the bumps out of the road early, which was really nice and set us up for when it was time to actually work on the PDN and start integrating this thing with another site. We already have a ton of components that we can now take and put directly into that. And there's only a few that we have to add in order to make sure that we have room for technical documentation and support articles and communities and all the other stuff that the PDM um, has. So the next thing you have to do is enlist a volunteer army. And this is where it gets really fun because when you sell a design system and you get people to agree, yes, this needs to be a product with a roadmap and a backlog and you need people. God, you need people. You think you're going to get this. You're like, yeah, I need like a few developers, a couple designers, we need someone to be the product owner, I guess that'll be me, I'll take that on, it'll be great. Realistically, you figure you're probably going to get this. Yeah, I probably won't get all of those, I'll get like three designers, maybe two designers, and then I'll be able to manage them. What you're actually going to get is maybe three people if you're lucky, and then half of three long. That's what you're going to get. And you have to figure out how to make that work. And there's a couple of aspects to this. All right? The other thing that you might run into is something that Salem is very familiar with. Why can't I just get one of the developers to work on this on Fridays? <laughs> yeah, we never heard that. Oh, can't you just do it on Fridays? I even threw one of those at you. And here's why. Because there's always a deadline on Friday. <laughs> always, inevitably. Um, also, I don't know what kind of sites everybody else works on. We work on enterprise websites. One of our websites, just one, has something like 80,000 nodes. One guy working on Friday afternoons is not going to be a design system that actually accommodates that. You need a lot more. But you have to recognize that you're starting off slow, right? You bought people have bought into this, but they're still a little skeptical. You have to you have to get them in, and you have to make it really really easy for people who are invested in this to help you out. And this is where things like documentation comes in, um, inviting people, showing off what you've done, giving them information on how they can actually help you create some of these things, opening up that aperture, almost making a miniature open source project within your organization. It's not quite that way, but it's close. And once you get them started, you want to make sure that they're able to actually take that action. All right? Again, documentation. Boy, do we wish we had some documentation. We so wish that we had some documentation right now. Um, because people get worried. Designers wonder if their creativity is going to be limited. What's the point of me if I'm just putting together components on a page? What's the point of what I'm doing? Is this going to limit me? What if I need to do something, something custom? Developers also wonder, what's the point of me being here if all I'm going to do is wire this stuff up to Drupal? What if the, what if the business demands that I do something custom? How do I override things? Right? What, um, and also, one of the things that we find periodically what if the developers feel like, well, I have to wait for these guys to be done before I can do anything. So, so I thought this was supposed to make it faster. Why is it slower? Um, and the stakeholders just always wonder when they're going to get it. They want it done now. Why isn't it done now? When are we going to get this thing? So part of the way that you deal with this is by over communicating. So one of the things we do is a weekly status update that goes out in email and gets put up in Confluence. All the things are in Confluence. I manage the Confluence space and it's like a mess of just, here, you, you're wondering what it is? Go look, it's right here, let me send you a link. Um, I also put together a status board in Confluence of all of the components that we put together in the design system and where they are in the workflow. 
So there's a handful that we've got in the planned category. There's a handful that we've got in the, in the proposed category because we know we're going to need them for the next thing that we're working on. And it gives people an instant view, albeit a messy one, of look at all the stuff we did. And this ties into the next thing, which is making sure that you're generating and celebrating wins as early as humanly possible. Now, the key to this is you can't be, you can't overdo it, right? If someone can't physically see something, it does not help for you to jump in and say, awesome, we did this awesome thing that I will totally show you tomorrow. That doesn't work. But you can find ways to celebrate wins early enough in the game that give people a realistic sense of what to expect. For example, when you actually have the roadmap. You can celebrate that. You can say, we worked on the roadmap for V1. We have a plan in place. When you actually launch that first release that has just the basic architecture, send that out in an email with, 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 we just released colors and fonts. At this point, a developer can actually pull this into our library on any of these different sites, run a quick update, and they will have all of our colors and fonts there. So it's not necessarily something you can see but it's telling people, look at what's been done. This already is helping us move towards this consistency that we're talking about. Another thing you can do, if you're me, is put together fancy PowerPoint slides for executives. This was a really nice one, because what I was able to do is work with my designer, who um, Adam, who is the design lead on the system. And he, in 45 minutes, put together this new comp using all of the components we already had in the system. Before we had Bolt, this could take up to two or three weeks. This particular layout between approvals and everything else we had to do took something like three months because they just couldn't make up their mind and they just kept turning and turning and turning and turning. And then documenting this thing took another like week and a half so the developers could actually implement it. We were just in a meeting with a CMO where I showed the slide, and he asked one of our content editors, could you build this page today? And he said, well, after the next release, yes, I could build that. No dev, no design required. Content editors can now build a large portion of Pega.com because of the components that we put in so far. Showing that kind of progress and showing a little more fidelity at each step along the way creates a huge impact in terms of that system and gets you over some of the humps. Because boy, will there be humps. Once you start getting these wins, it's time to sustain this acceleration. Right? which means that you have to recognize when some of these pitfalls are going to come and you have to be prepared to deal with them. So if you remember the emotional journey we talked about earlier, there are a couple of low points. The first one is in that those early days, that planning phase, when you and the team are still getting your stuff together, planning all the components, building out all the architecture, doing the plumbing, as, as my boss likes to say, because none of that is visible to the stakeholders, they get nervous. They wonder where's the ROI. They said, you were supposed to, this was supposed to make things faster. Where is it? Why isn't it here yet? Then there's when the, there's the point at which you start integrating into the product. And you realize that all of this beautiful architecture that someone was supposed to be able to just plug into Drupal doesn't quite plug into Drupal the way you want it to, and then people can't really figure out what's going on because everyone is too single-threaded and, and there's just not enough people. And so the developers start thinking, I, I thought this was supposed to save me time. Why is this taking so long? This is ridiculous. And they might even threaten that they want to throw the whole thing out the window and you get very, very stressed out and you need a lot of chocolate. <laughs> And then you try to figure out, okay, what do I do now? So the most important thing that I discovered 
recently, is that too often when we are thinking of a design system, of selling a design system, we're focused mostly on the systems team and we're focused on the business. We want our stakeholders to be happy. We want the people who write the checks to continue writing the checks. And like all good designers, we forget that we're also making this so that the designers will use it and the development team will use it. And if these people do not actually use it, the business will not be happy because they've invested a whole bunch of money and a whole bunch of time in letting you run around and play in a design system that no one wants to use. So, being a researcher, I did research. My, um, we have a vendor, Basalt, who is working with us on the architecture for our design system, along with Salem. One of their team members, David, was nice enough to do a bunch of stakeholder interviews for us, to interview key players in the design system, get their opinions of it, get their perceptions of it, align on a set of um, recommendations for how to go forward. I went around and talked to all of the developers who had to work with the design system and say, what are the things that you are finding that are making things difficult for you? Now, we have a set of findings and a path forward that we can use to make things better for the people who have to use this thing and to start chipping away at some of the debt that we took on in our effort to move fast and break things and get this thing out the door. And Salem, as lovely as he is, has already started shipping away at the list of things that we have to get done to make things easier for people. And this, by the way, this is one of the things that you get when you go through this process and you recognize that this is as much an emotional journey for the organization as it is a technical journey for your team. Because if we hadn't done this, and we hadn't invested so much time and so much energy in this project, I gotta tell you, half the team was ready to quit yesterday, uh, like last week. <laughs> and now we understand, and we're like, okay, we got a way forward. And that happens a lot when you're working on a team. I don't know how many of you guys have felt like you're on a death march <laughs> until you realize, oh yeah, we're doing something big. Doing big things is hard. That's what we're dealing with. So once you've done that, it's time to institute the change. It's time to make this part of our DNA. I almost said Donna because I was watching zoology. What was that one? The Zootopia? Yes, sorry. I have a five year old. Um, so, this is actually from an Ethan Curtis article. We realize the system's value when companies ship, ship products that are made from its parts. It's all well and good to have a design system. If you have not rolled this out across your products or developers aren't willing to use it, you don't really have a design system. You have a side hustle. And that's not useful to the business. So, again, this is about over communicating. I know, right? Um, having roadmaps, having release plans, being able to show executives look at all the stuff we have now, look at everything we've done. Once you start scaling, once you've got a baseline in place, you have to start looking at, okay, what's next? How do we evolve this? How do we get this to the next level that it needs to be? What are the things that we have to plan for? So some of the things that you could do is start looking at the future, right? So right now, our design system is mostly focused on Drupal sites because that's what our digital presence is on. But we also have a number of internal apps that have to fit into our visual ecosystem. So how do we set ourselves up so that eventually our applications can consume the design system? What if there's some other hotness that's built on React or something, someone's doing a mobile app that needs to be visually consistent? How can we set ourselves up for success there? 
So the strategic vision keeps growing as the system evolves. And your roadmap keeps aligning to those business initiatives, to those, those things that you know are on the horizon. So for example, when I was working on the roadmap, on the latest version of the roadmap, I started looking at the different redesign projects we knew we were going to have to get on. And started aligning the roadmap to those. Okay, well, we've got the PDN coming, so I know we're going to need book navigation, we're going to need stuff for community stuff, um, so we're going to need a handful of components there. And then we've got sales stuff that's mostly reused, but we've got a couple of new components that might come in. So you start planning along those lines, knowing what you've got. Uh, what you got coming down the pike, and you get a sense of how the system is going to evolve over time. So the takeaway, that's pretty much the whole framework. Um, the main things I want to leave you with, the biggest thing is that a design system is organizational change. There's no two ways about it. Especially, and, and, and especially if you've got a design system that's going to go across multiple product lines, which most scalable design systems are. You want to have a vision that not only sets people up to be really jazzed about this and, and sustains them through the inevitable dips, but also something that clearly aligns to the strategic vision for the business. Um, you want to have a pitch deck. You want to have essentially a set of a story that you can tell about the need for the system, what you've gotten from it, and what you plan to get from it. And you want to have that at the ready at every point during the journey. So you'll have one deck that you use primarily to sell this to people, and then you've got another deck that you're going to have to use to give people status updates and keep people informed and invested in what's going on, and that's going to evolve over time. Um, I think the most important the two things are expect that you're not going to have a lot of people at the beginning, and that you're going to have to enlist volunteers to help. Um, but also plan to gain momentum and gain new resources, and how are you going to open this up? You have to expect that there's going to be bumps in the road. Some days are going to suck, and then other days you're going to be completely elated, which I heard is basically developer work in a nutshell. <laughs> I could be wrong. Um, treat your design system as a product. Give it a roadmap, a vision, a strategy. Anything you can do to keep people invested and keep the train moving. Because the minute it looks like the train's not moving, the wheels can fall off. And finally, talk to your users, damn it. <laughs> no. I say this as a researcher and also as a person who likes to understand. Um, it can only do you well. That's all I got. Could I add one thing? Sure. Before the clap? Because that was awesome. Before the clap. <laughs> <laughs> After the clap. Okay. No. Yes. In between. Um, I was fired once for talking to the users. I was no. <laughs> so what were you saying to the them? Chain. Well, I was managing the whole product thing and getting feedback and doing all of that. Oh. They didn't want to spend time doing that. Oh. That was an unnecessary step. But anyway, thank you. No problem. I actually once had a, C a CTO who said, oh, well, you, know, you didn't really need to do all that user research. Yeah. Yeah. You could have just asked me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like I've got more than enough time for questions because my presentations always run short. So, yeah. Um, you the, the approach you're, you're doing because it's or change is you're doing a big a big system approach. What mm. if you did it one project at a time? What if, since you run the design group, mm -hmm. what if you took the first design that, that's down, that's coming down your way, mm -hmm. made that the basis for your design system, work that out with your designers, 
take that to the next project and build it from the ground up. That's kind of what we're doing, actually. Um, so originally, we had a few fits and starts with the early pieces of the design system, but one of the opportunities that we had was there was a rebrand, a rebrand coming. Um, so what we were able to do was we knew that we needed to re-platform to AAA. We knew that there was an evolution of the brand. Everyone said, oh no, the re-platform is just going to be lift and shift. And I was like, yeah, there's a new CMO. It's going to be a redesign. And wouldn't you know, redesign. So we used the relaunch of Pega.com as the genesis of the latest version of our design system. So, so all of the components that we built for Pega.com are now available for PDM. So now the next piece is going there. There are a lot of things that we did really well during that, quite frankly. Um, there were a lot of things that we could have done better. But one of the benefits of that approach was it felt, a, it felt very bumpy at first, but we also know that it's going to even out. Because like I said, at this point, probably 75% of the website you can build with existing components after we get through the next launch. So on that level now, the CMO is like, oh, wait, you can build this page and we don't need a developer? Sweet. Um, in previous iterations, even though we were trying on the design side to make things consistent and use the same components, it was still an entirely different code base. So no matter what, if you're trying to make things consistent, a developer has to go and like, if things change on peg.com, a developer would actually have to go into all of these different websites and change everything. And we're already starting to realize like that in itself is a huge undertaking. Like literally we just went back and changed the fonts on one of our sites so that they would be consistent with the new brand and that itself was like two weeks of dev work to change the fonts. And it's not because of the design system, it's just because of the code base. Yeah. Uh, could you talk about what Drupal modules may have played into this process or other uh projects on GitHub, are there parts out there that go into this? The pain, no, um, <laughs> um, the, yeah, so the biggest one is paragraphs. Yeah, the biggest one is paragraphs. Um, we've got paragraphs, we've got pattern lab. Um, there's some kind of JSON schema. He knows much more about the tech side than me. Uh, so UI patterns is like a big role, so we have more standardized definitions. Here's the data you can pass into a component. Here's the contract that Drupal and, and the front end um, are agreeing to. Um, Pattern Labs is actually playing a crazy huge role in, in our design system. Um, one of the most common misconceptions I've uh, I had chats about is Pattern Lab is not the design system. Pattern Lab is not both. Pattern Lab is a way to view the source of truth in both. Mm -hmm. um, I've had the privilege of working with some of the um, big head honchos uh, in the Pattern Lab world and actually basically reviving the Drupal Pattern Lab PHP edition, providing, providing it from the dead at last DrupalCon. So, um, yes, it, 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 you know, needless to say, Pattern Lab is a huge part of our DNA right now. Um, the components module is also a huge piece, so having a way to reference, you know, one pattern, referencing another pattern, referencing another pattern, having a consistent between the two is really huge. Um, and honestly, just sharing the same Twig extensions, so making Pattern Lab work better with the Apple Twig extensions. Um, not like not like the watered down version of it, but actually like can we back and forth with Ripple's doing under the hood, make it work in the same front end environment. So you don't need to have a database running, but still speak the same Drupalisms that you'd expect if the code's getting pulled up. So there's a lot more I could talk for hours, but <laughs> he he literally could. You should you should give him beer and he'll tell you. Any other questions? Yeah. You must have had a pattern library on the peg of the application side. 
We, yes and no. So the, the product has something called the UI kit, um, which is now being deprecated in favor of something else. Um, so the code base itself is a legacy, like 35-year-old code base that's still being cleaned up. Um, we've done, the product side has done a lot of work to start the process of cleaning that up, but it's still relatively new. Um, they are now getting closer towards a digital design, like a, a code base design system like we are developing. But prior to that, it was mostly sticker sheets, essentially, um, for the designers, because the code base itself was so bloated that it would just take forever to do it. It's moving towards the right thing, though. Yeah. I think one of the big, um, one of the big key differences between what, um, what we've seen in other implementations um, and what we're trying to do here with Bold design system is single sources of truth wherever possible. And I mean that in terms of you know, front end development, I mean that in terms of UX and design. Um, you know, our design team has been uh, running with some, you know, frankly, really crazy, awesome tools, um, abstract. So having actual like, version control uh, sketch files has been crazy. Um, having you know, the same sort of like components inside of components inside of components sort of hierarchy in literally the design artifacts so that designers are speaking the same terms and thinking about things the same way that we are on the front end has really been, um, you know, it's been a really awesome journey in the last couple of uh, years we've been working on this. Um, one of the big things that we're trying to do with both though is take our color palette. Um, a lot of design systems, a lot of style guides, a lot of style guides we've seen have, you know, pretty color palettes, swatches, whatever, but it's hard coded. So as soon as, you know, a designer uh, or, or, you know, product requirement, whatever, decides to tweak those little design hex values ever so slightly, that goes out of date almost as soon as you launch it. So for us, it's putting in that little extra work as needed to make those things be up to date and synced up with the source of truth. So if there's only one place in the whole system that defines, defines your color palette, you update it in one single place, and then every other thing is just pointing at that. It's always in the case. So when you add a new color because it's a requirement, yeah. the color palette page is up to date as soon as you add that new hex value. But you just read it, you know, if, if you've got a little niche need, you now change the, the design system for everyone. That's how, that's what the politics are. Yeah, uh, and, and, and that's just, right. And, and just to be clear, it's not a big text value and then the live website has it. It's in my own local code base, mm -hmm. you know, it's populated it everywhere. You still have to actually publish that change. You still have to pull and have to run npm update bold slash colors and, and pull those in. Mm -hmm. um, but we're definitely making that process from front end developer or, you know, unicorn designer developer making an update, publishing it, and pulling it, and we're trying to make that time period as short as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, the other piece of it is, the other piece of it is, is like Salem was saying, governance, right? Part of our situation right now at PEGA is we're really at the point where we're, where the system is gaining maturity, right? It's still very much in its infancy. We've been, like, the, the official effort started when I was on maternity leave last year. So I ended up finding out that my the designer sold this thing as a product and said, like, we're doing this as a team after I've been ranting about it for two years. Because, um, <laughs> you know, I listen to the, to the lady who knows what she's doing. Um, but anyway, so it's only been, I guess, a year at this point, barely, since we started this. Um, so it's still very rocky because we're still building up the library of patterns and we're doing it alongside the rebrand and one of the things that's nice that there's a couple of advantages that we have that the product doesn't one we have a new cmo new brand so at this point literally if you show something that has the wrong color on it he's like that green not on the palette you need to change it 
right? So he's helping to enforce some of that governance, whereas the previous CMO didn't necessarily care. Um, the other piece is that we are building a new code base where we platform, where the product, if they tried to roll out a design system tomorrow, they would have to fight with 1,400 developers to get this thing rolled out and a 35-year-old code base. We've got like 20, maybe 30 now, because we've got a bunch of new people coming in. And essentially a brand new code base. We're just integrating with a bunch of legacy stuff. So we have a huge advantage right now, as, as, as tough as some days see. Um, and, and I can tell you, as someone who's been in the middle of more than one organizational change effort, it's so nice to remind yourself <laughs> that this is actually good, as opposed to really, really stressful. Um, this shit is very hard. Yes, and which is why it's worth doing. If you wanted to come and, and eat chips all day, like you could do that, I suppose. Benji. I, I think there is an analogy here between the, the, the sort of no unicorns philosophy that the design system imposes. I can mm -hmm. go, oh, I want my sparkly unicorn to have chartreuse pajamas, and we don't have chartreuse on the color palette. Um, and, and what I call the, the paradox of a content management system like mm -hmm. Google. Um, the paradox being that although some things that are really, really hard if, if you're coming from the world of coding individual pages in HTML, suddenly become easy. Oh, you want a blog? A blog. Mm -hmm. Other things like, oh, this title should be in italics. No, you can't do that because it comes from the film formatter mm -hmm. and uh, some, some things become really hard. And what we win overall is consistency. Yeah. And I think that, that's a big game for, for both sides. Well, and it's interesting because there's consistency, but there's also flexibility. So one of the things that the team has done really, really well is the ability to create color themes. Right, so we have a dark theme, an X dark theme, a light theme, an X light theme. So there's a col there are these color themes where all of the things that sit in relationship to those themes change depending on what the theme is. So our blue button, which is our standard primary action button in a header, if you're on a light or an X light theme, that's a blue button. If you're on a dark or an X dark theme, it's yellow because that's more accessible, it works better. Now, in our previous design system, all of the buttons were that obnoxious shade of blue that we were looking at earlier. And one of our products, the main color was bright orange. And I remember distinctly, I was interviewing someone, and I just showed them this page, this bright orange header, nasty blue button. Said, what would you do to fix that? And she looked at it and said, a designer approved that. <laughs> right? Now, our content editors can make those choices and they don't end up messing it up because the code does it for them. So that's kind of the beauty of it. If you really are able to, one of the things that a design system forces you to do is think about all of the different ways that this has to scale. And when I think about this design system versus the one that I worked on when I was at HBR, that was much more of a pattern library. And it didn't accommodate all of the different variations that people had to go through. So you would think, see things like a bright red link on a medium gray background, or a dark gray bit of text on a medium gray background. <laughs> I I saw too much of it, and I had to remind people that glasses are also assistive technology, so you can't use the screen reader's excuse about accessibility. But that's a whole other talk. Sam? I'd also say that, so on one hand, we, you know, we cannot read the dog map. We really can't. We will be dead in the water if you're like, no, this is how it works. Top, you know, top block if it doesn't do exactly what you want it to do, and your use case, you're fine with marketing team's needs and all the sales, you know, the, the million and a half other people that are reading down your end users text. You know, having a design system that is as flexible and as forgiving as humanly possible is paramount. Um, so in some
some, some regards, like the, the color thing that Danny's talking about, you know, we want to make it hard to break stuff when it makes sense. But we still have ways to customize, we still have ways to really configure it to, you know, use cases we didn't even imagine would, would happen out in the real world. Um, and sure as heck makes stress testing and, and like doing real trials kind of exciting and scary. Um, I would definitely say that empowering content authors to you know, use Lego blocks, and, you know, and paragraphs and Lego blocks and but um, realistically, what comes out of the bolt is not going to be, it's not gonna, we're never going to be able to get every use case figured out. So our best bet to make sure that the polka dot, you know, the dots, whatever, characters, get, we need to think about these things in terms of tools, higher and higher level uh, order tools. So if you're, you know, maybe your button's fine, but your button inside of this car, inside of this van, inside of this other region, you know, there's going to be some, there's going to be some point in that hierarchy where someone's going to be like, no, that doesn't quite do what I want it to do. But you know what, maybe the tools one level deeper, one level deeper than that to what they want to do. Maybe they can they can use those things to kind of build their own little, little thing here, that special snowflake. And that special snowflake is, you know, uh, valuable and, and we see a lot of reuse in other, uh, other properties. That's how it gets up back into the design system. So it's not just like shipping whole big bang things, it's shipping the pieces and pieces of those pieces and empowering everyone else downstream to build and solve their own problems. And then hopefully maybe some stuff can come from that we can pull back into the scary, but um, heck, even just the Drupal integration piece, you know, understanding how, you know, in what ways do we need to be crazy flexible to support what Drupal does out of the box, and Drupal does very well, and what areas do we want to stay the ground a little bit more, and, you know, make sure that Drupal is using the best parts of it, but also able to accommodate, you know, maybe some better practices nowadays, or, and like responsive leaks or lazy loading or whatnot. Um, it's definitely a two-way street. It's not just, well, that's a bit of practical over time or, you know, it's triples away or the highway. There's a lot of compromise. There's a lot of work through those little implementation details. All right, so I think there's time for one or two more questions. Anyone have anything else? All right, and I thank you and I bid you adieu.